Hi, everybody. It's Ivan Molyneux, Free Domain Radio. Hope you're doing well. This is a long, but I think incredibly powerful and essential conversation that I had with Dr. Linda Gottfriedson. She's a professor of educational psychology at the University of Delaware and the co-director of the Delaware Johns Hopkins Project for the Study of Intelligence and Society. Um, her work has been highly influential in shaping U.S. public and private policies regarding affirmative action, hiring quotas, and race norming on aptitude tests. Uh, she is on the boards of the International Society for the Study of Individual Differences, the International Society for Intelligence Research, and the editorial boards of the scientific journals Intelligence, Learning, and Individual Differences and Society. Uh, on a personal note, I consider her to be um, brave, uh, heroic, and noble, and uh, the degree to which she deeply cares about successful resolution to social challenges in the realm of intelligence is deeply moving and inspirational for me. And um, she talks about the need to understand what intelligence is and how intelligence shapes society and the degree to which it differs across various populations within society. And um, it's a very powerful and important conversation for you to listen to. Once you really start to understand intelligence and its bell curve distribution across the populations, not only is it hard to look at society the same way again, you know, the old saying that says, a mind once stretched by a new idea never regains its original shape. Well, prepare yourself for some mind-bending information and for a way of looking at society that uh, is not only more accurate but in fundamental ways, much more compassionate. So without any further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. Linda Gottfriedson. So thanks so much, uh, Dr. Gottfriedson, for joining us today. And, and people are obviously curious as to why I'm focusing so much on uh, intelligence. And I think it's partly because it seems to me there's this parallel universe or two universes when it comes to examining the somewhat or seemingly intractable social problems that almost all societies, particularly Western multicultural societies, are facing. And my sort of history was, I read The Bell Curve when I was in uh, grad school in the 90s, and, you know, it kind of was like, wow, what a fascinating thesis. And then because it's never or rarely referred to in the mainstream media, it just kind of blew like tumbleweeds out of my brain. And then when I started researching why there was an economic crash in 2007, 2008, I was led back to um, uh, the government's desire to get more minorities into housing and some of the results, uh, negative results that came out of that. And that kind of drew me back into the fold as far as looking at society through the lens of intelligence. Mm -hmm. And I know from the experts that I've talked to and the research that I've done, that that which is uncontroversial within the learned disciplines, within the ac academicians, is something that is deeply and, and shockingly horrifying to the general public. And I really try to, you know, build these canals between academia and the general public, because otherwise we're trying to guide society without anybody who knows how to navigate. And that, I think, is a real shame. So that was sort of my background. And, and I think now that I've really immersed myself in the IQ stuff and the G stuff and the ethnic differences stuff, I'm trying not to become the one theory explains everything kind of guy, but I find it almost impossible to look at social problems without first asking myself, what is the intelligence ratios? What are the intelligence differences that may be occurring in these disparate groups? It's not the final answer, of course. It's not the only place you want to go, but I'm finding it a pretty useful start. So that's sort of my background. And I know for a lot of people, you know, I mean, I remember taking Psych 101 way back in the day, and we went through IQ stuff. But a lot of people have received their information about intelligence and IQ from the popular media, which is kind of like getting your cosmology from the 12th century Catholic Church, which <laughs> doesn't really help. So I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about uh, IQ as a whole, intelligence as a whole, and what people's misconceptions are about it. Okay, it's not just the media that miseducate people, it's also many different um, college disciplines. Uh, sociology, anthropology, English, uh, just about uh, any of the disciplines. Um, education, which is where I'm lodged. Uh, so it's, it's widespread, uh, perhaps especially in education because schools are supposed to be the great equalizers, right? And the other thing I'd say, it's important, not just between races, but within races too. There are huge differences within races. 
and uh, the differences between races are just a special case of that, uh, where the, the, the middle of the pack falls is just different along the same very long continuum. And I, I did a sort of a segment on a show recently, which was sort of tongue in cheek, whereas, uh, you know, when you see a tall person, you can see, hey, that person's really tall. I'm looking up their nose, you know, the old joker, how's the weather up there kind of stuff. But a smart person doesn't show up as immediately obvious to the lay person. Yet it seems to me that the differences in human intelligence are so extreme. You know, somebody with an IQ of 160 isn't just, you know, 60 points smarter in a sense than somebody with an IQ of 100. They almost seem to me like a different kind of animal in terms of what they can do. And the degree to which, uh, as Charles Murray points out, we have this inverted pyramid of achievement within a civilization that the top, you know, 0.01% of the gifted people tend to move things along in a way that nobody else seems to be able to do. And I think that lack of visibility of the effects of intelligence or the lack of understanding of the degree to which smart people are different from regular folk, uh, it makes it hard for people to understand things like wealth inequality or um, disproportionate uh, abilities in any particular discipline. And then they generally come up with um, kind of pseudo-scientific you know, gender sexism or, or racism or, you know, it's um, the one percent where you just inherit your money and stuff like that. And I think it's really hard for people to factor in the divergences in intelligence. We see this in other areas, you know, when you, you think of singers, there are some people who are naturally gifted and great singers. And, you know, everyone who takes singing lessons can probably improve a bit, but there's no substitute for having the physical equipment, at least as far as I read some of the uh, IQ data. Well, it's true. There is no IQ stamped on your head. There's uh, no IQ, um, no intelligence, no G stamped on your head. But I would point out that... Um, especially when you're dealing with um, general populations or mass institutions where you have people of all ability levels, the differences can be quite obvious, say in elementary school or in military induction, especially when they, before they were screening out low ability men. Um, now, it is true that people segregate uh, sort of by IQ, and as, as Charles Murray and Richard Herrnstein pointed out, people of high IQ often have no idea what people at other levels of, of intelligence can and can't do. I remember giving a talk in Oxford once where I was uh, describing the everyday, uh, what are called literacy tasks, people can and can't do at different levels of literacy. And for example, um, describing five levels of literacy measured by the US Department of Education, uh, very well done. And at the lowest of five levels, a person, for example, has an 80% chance of finding one piece of information specified beforehand in a short sports article. Now, the percentage of people, uh, adults who can't regularly do items that are difficult in the general U.S. population, is about 14%. Mm -hmm. Well, what if you go up to the next level? Can they find two pieces of information in a simple sports article? Um, there, that's where another 25% of people top out. And it goes on and on. And they simply would not believe me. They said, that can't be. I don't know anybody like that. But it's if you look at the health field, there are many people who cannot tell the time of an appointment on an appointment slip. And that's a lot of people. People just don't, if they don't associate with people like that, they don't know. The other explanation is that I think a lot of high intelligence people are trying to justify um, morally their own status, or, um, and so they're, they have to say, well, everybody could be like me, and uh, don't blame me for getting ahead. So there are lots of reasons, and uh, it's just politically incorrect um, in virtually all fields to even say that intelligence exists, let alone differences. 
Oh, it's often struck me that uh, some of the um, more extreme forms of leftism, such as communism and so on, that comes out of an intellectual's horror at the idea of being, say, a lathe operator or part of the sort of factory assembly line. And what happens is, if you're a really smart person, you look at that life and you say, well, that person must be miserable because you'd be miserable in that position. Uh, yeah. But that's not, I mean, I, I grew up fairly poor and, and went uh, worked with a lot of people who um, didn't have a lot of intellectual abilities, waiters and, and uh, machine operators and so on. You know, they'd go to work, they'd have fun and they'd enjoy themselves. And it was a different kind of life. And I think the failure of highly intelligent people to understand that just because they'd be horrified by a particular occupation doesn't mean that it's innately horrifying and needs to be fixed. I think that's a mistake. Uh, I've always felt that it was totally unfortunate or inappropriate for people who go to college to say that college is is the be-all and end-all, that people in working occupations, well, they're not really good occupations. That's crazy. Um, and people should be in occupations that they feel like they do well. And I know a lot of electricians who make a lot more money than I do. So um, there's many occupations that are really rewarding for for people who aren't geniuses or aren't high level. There's nothing worse than being in a job where you're over your head. Oh, no, absolutely. I totally get that. So uh, uh, people who hear the word IQ, uh, of course, hear a, a lot of myths about it. And we're going to say myths, which is begging the question, but we'll make the case. Or at least you'll make the case. Uh, the first myth is that, OK, so maybe there's a test that people are good at, but all it measures is their ability to take an IQ test. It doesn't translate into real world. We'll take these one at a time. So they say, okay. well, it doesn't translate into real world stuff. And um, my understanding is that it's actually very good at predicting uh, life outcomes. And there's not a wide divergence between between IQ tests and things like socioeconomic status or even health outcomes or um, level of education and income and so on, it does seem to test something that translates at least into a relatively free market into a sorting and rewarding by intelligence. Yes, and it helps to predict, although at different levels, virtually everything we do in life that has any reasoning or learning involved. And uh, it might help to explain uh, or describe what intelligence is, not de define it as such, but um, what it appears to be with a lot of research. And then we can go into that. It's the ability or proficiency, differences in proficiency at, at learning, reasoning, abstract thinking, problem solving. Um, so it's very general. I mean, try to think of a part of life where you don't learn, or you don't have to learn, or you don't have to problem solve. Okay. Uh, so it's and let me let me give you a, a very specific example of what it means. Uh, more generally, back up. More generally, it's the ability to process complex information. It's uh, mental manipulation. And I'll give you um, an example where you and your viewers can feel what I mean. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting over a cold. A lot of uh, individually administered intelligence tests, and those are the gold standard, they're not paper and pencil, um, have two subtests that are called digits forward and digits backward. Digits forward, and this is to assess how much you can keep in mind, okay, is kind of working memory. Um, so, digits forward, just, you don't have to do it out loud. I tell my students, you don't have to do it out loud, but do the following. Okay, ready? Yeah. <laughs> um, digits forward, I'll give you five numbers, and then after I stop, I want you to repeat them in your head. This is digits forward. Four nine, seven, one, two. Piece of cake, right? Okay, next one, two, five, seven, three. Okay, usually uh, that one, my students, I see them looking at the ceiling, their eyes are rolling. What was the difference between the two, Stefan? 
for you? What was the difference? Oh, it's really different. One, of course, it looks like you're looking at a picture, and in another one, it feels like you're taking some model and shuffling it around in your head, which is, you know, much more taxing. Yes, you have to remember it, then you have to flip it. That's more mental manipulation. And virtually everything that involves intelligence, well, it is the ability to manipulate information, especially more complex information. More information, um, things that are more distant, uh, more different. Um, so it's a general capacity for, as I say, processing information. And so intelligence tests get at that in um, all the subtests do it. And this, and I'll explain something that, that helps um, explain one of the myths. Intelligence tests are the scores. Are cre the scores are created by adding up the scores on, say, 11, 12 subtests. Okay? Now, people think that, well, okay, intelligence is just like marbles in a jar. Right? You're just adding up different things. But it turns out that no matter what test you give or subtest, they all correlate with each other. If you're better on one, you're better on the other. So what does that mean? It means they're not independent abilities. And you can use a statistical procedure to figure out the overlap between them. Okay? So they're all getting at something of the same thing. And this was discovered over a century ago, so it's, it's not like a new finding. And if you take away, if you find that common thing, uh, it turns out to dominate most of what a test measures if you add up lots of items. And that's what we call G for the general mental ability or general intelligence factor. So, I'm sorry, just, uh, just interrupt, because people do get this sort of this, this idiot savant thing where you're really smart at something, or yeah, yeah. Uh, as, as I think you've written, uh, or um, people have written and say, well, we all know somebody who's really great at math and like, will never read a novel or something like that. But uh, that doesn't generally work out in terms of tests, that we, we don't have these isolated abilities. I sort of think of G like um, your body's ability to you know, pump oxygen through vessels to the blood, to, to, to the muscles, to, to make people run fast or whatever. Uh, right. An athlete is not going to be really great at running uh, and then you know, really bad at jumping. I mean, they may not be as good at jumping, but they're still going to be very fit all around. And so G to me is like general fitness, That's and then you can exactly. train it for specific abilities. Now, your example shows some of the reasons why people um, misunderstand. Their, your verbal ability is, is probably higher than your math ability because of just from the job you're in, right? And uh, you, if you look at college majors, you find that some college, some college majors, journalism, English, are dominated by people with a profile of abilities. They're all bright, okay? But those in the English and journalism are better relatively in English to math. And you can see that on GRE um, tests or the SAT. So those differences do matter when you're selecting and uh, pursuing different high-level occupations. But all those people are bright. They didn't get into college uh, without being above average, I suspect. So um, if you're looking at other people who are bright, maybe that's the major difference is their math ability versus their verbal ability. But you put them in the general population and that's not the case. They will, they will be bright in both of those compared to the general population. So, um, but if you, and this is an interesting fact, if you use a test of verbal ability to protect to predict math ability and verbal ability, it does about the same, okay, if you're using the general population, because most of the math test is measuring G, hmm. the general ability. Most of the verbal test is measuring G. And um, what you find is that even in predicting job performance, 
adding all those special tests above a test of G doesn't make much difference in predicting job performance. And you know what's so, interesting, uh, and, and I've mentioned this in terms of college as a whole, and I don't want to necessarily go on a big college tangent, but mm -hmm. uh, this idea that, well, if we get more people into college, they'll be smarter, that to me is like saying, well, if we put more people on basketball teams, they'll get taller. That college pre-selects for intelligence, dumping more people of average ability into college is only going to make college have to be dumbed down rather than making people smarter in general. And uh, this, when I was an entrepreneur, we had, of course, the big challenge of, of being an entrepreneur, of running a company, is hiring people of yes, best possible yes. ability. And we tried just about everything, uh, interviews and written t uh, tests. And, and anyway, we ended up developing, um, just on our own, um, a series of questions that were supposed to measure something that couldn't be memorized, the so reasoning on the fly and so right. on. And we found that, like, bar none, that was by far the best way of figuring out who was going to be successful uh, in the long run. And um, it's always struck me that if you could just give an IQ test or some equivalent that maybe didn't need a professional, some IQ test to people coming in, we could save billions and billions of dollars of, uh, in a sense, wasted capital for people having to go to the IQ proxy test of a college degree. But of course, it's really difficult in the United States in particular, as far as I understand it, to just apply a simple intelligence test to people coming into your field. You're, you're absolutely right. And I don't, I only know one intelligence test that's routinely used to screen, do a first screen, and the NFL uses it too, it is the Wonderluck personnel test. It's a 12 minute, 50 item test that has some analogies, some math word problems, and it does about as well as one of these gold standard tests in lining people up according to their G or general ability level. Um, now, going back to hiring, I, I did a lot of research in that area some years back, and um, there are lots of controversies then. It was a time when you couldn't use any mental test without getting sued because the, is the way regulations stand in, in the law is that you're guilty if there's disparate impact in selecting. That's different proportions of different racial groups. Prima facie case of discrimination. Um, and you, it needn't be an intelligence test, it could be a basic skills test, it can be one that they spent, uh, you know, years developing. This is an employer or a, a city jurisdiction for hiring firefighters, for example. And, um, but the better the test, the more, in terms of selecting for G, the worse the disparate impact. So, it became very difficult to jump the hoops to show, quote, job relatedness. Okay, you had to show job relatedness, jump through a whole lot of hoops. Well, employers have been able to do that now uh, pretty well. The big employers, you know, the AT&Ts and, um, and so on. Um, but so a, a funny thing happened then. Okay? Because it was well known that tests that are not biased, and I don't know any professionally developed test that is, uh, when the person taking the test speaks English, any kind of English, is that suddenly uh, one eminent panel discovered that statistically they were still unfair so that you could race norm the tests. That is, you give a bonus points to the lower scoring, members of the lower scoring races, but not to Asians who score higher. And this was about to become law, that you could do this. It was, it was quotas, surreptitious quotas. Well, I helped expose that, and Congress banned it. Okay, so now what do you do? You can't use race norming, that is adjusting the scores um, by race, just adding points to equal them, equalize them. 
So the next thing that professionals tried, and I'm ashamed of my field for, for some people doing this, is that they, what I call, gerrymandered the tests. So they basically found pseudo statistical reasons to get rid of all the subtests that measured G. So it was all personality. And the only test of mental skill left was reading above the second percentile. Now, you say this is a joke, but the Department of Justice was part of this team and was going to force this test on all police departments around the United States. The idea was that if you can't have double standards, you have no standards. And I think that's one of the points you were getting at earlier. Well, that and was that, exposed, and that project was stopped, but the same principles are being applied everywhere. And this is something that, again, is well known within the professional literature and professional periodicals and so on, which is simply not making it out for a variety of reasons we could discuss, that there is a hierarchy that is currently recognized and uh, I think you gathered together a list of 50 or so experts who, who repeated all of this stuff ad infinitum, uh, still, again, not making it into general culture as a whole, which is that there is, um, you could roughly equate a sort of five-part uh, split or divergence among IQs for particular groups with, uh, I think, as um, Charles Murray pointed out, Ashkenazi Jews sort of at the top, uh, 110, 115, and if you just focus on uh, verbal, 120 yeah, plus. Yeah, these are the averages where the yeah. middle pack falls. Right. And then um, I've heard a variety for, um, for Asians, um, 103, 106, and so on, but very strong in visual spatial. You know, the, the, yeah. the sort of uh, myth of the, or, or the, the, the stereotype of the Asian engineer versus the Jewish engineer. Jews, Ashkenazi Jews actually score a little Jewish bit lawyer. below. <laughs> yeah, they score a little bit below the norm in visual spatial, but of course, in terms of language skills, they're through the roof, which is why you see a lot of writers and directors and, and so on. And so you've got Ashkenazi and Jews, and then you have uh, Asians, and then you have whites who are normed, Caucasians normed around 100, and then, uh, if I remember the numbers rightly, sort of low 90s for Hispanics, and then 85, which is a full standard deviation below whites for blacks. And these uh, differences America. have persisted for, a cons like, I think, as long as the tests have been going on. Right. And the more G-loaded the tests are, the more they're trying to measure general intelligence, which is directly associated with physical structures in the brain we can get into, the more G-loaded the tests are, uh, the more they tend to reaffirm this sort of five-point spread. And so when you look at society without seeing these differences in ethnicities and IQ, it really becomes hard to understand how society is and why it looks the way it looks without this. So I just, because I think a lot of people are still quite startled to hear that information, uh, I just wanted to give that background and of course correct me anywhere I may have gone astray. No, I would just add one more group, um, and that's African blacks. Mm. Um, the IQs of different uh, groups of African blacks, you know, range uh, more around 70. So um, I would add those as, as well. So there's a huge difference in, in uh, let's say, branches of the family tree as they've developed to this time. Now, it also helps, I remember, I, I knew the average differences for a long time, but it really stunned me when I realized or learned that an IQ of 85, which is the average for American blacks, is at the 15th percentile for whites. And that's actually the level at which the military does not accept anyone. So immediately you've ruled out about half American blacks. There's other, other criteria too. So it's a tremendous, I mean, a practical difference. And to show this up, uh, in, you know, to sort of very much paraphrase um, Hernstein and Murray, if you're looking at a particular ethnicity, say average income or average educational attainment or, or average health outcomes and so on, 
if you don't factor in IQ, you're not looking at things through a correct lens. Everything's blurred and distorted. And so the argument from the bell curve is something along these lines, that if you say, well, um, American blacks are doing worse than whites, well, that is a true statement. But it is clouding the fact that if you look at everybody, whether they're Asians or whites or Hispanics, if you group everybody who has an IQ average of 85, they all do about the same. And so what society is relentlessly sorting uh, through the free market, through educational opportunities and so on, what society is relentlessly doing is sorting by intelligence. And um, if you don't see that, then your only possible answer are, are the twofold usual historical answers for black underperformance in American society, which is uh, hi historical racism and, and the effects uh, and current racism and so on. But without seeing the IQ differences, uh, I believe that it is a very false and destructive answer because it doesn't identify the real problem when solutions may be possible. Well, you're, you're absolutely right that the belief that there are no differences has a tremendous effect on social policy, um, institutional policies, because... And, and I saw this early on, the more you have double standards, let's say in a college or in a job, the more you bring in um, black individuals who might have done quite well elsewhere into a position where they're almost bound to fail. And so the employment literature has found when, when companies do that, failure becomes color-coded. It's the blacks who fail, which only, um, which leads to lawsuits, <laughs> uh, among other things. So it's, what it does also, since none of us allowed can say that there's a difference, and, and many people truly believe there's no difference, what explains it, as you say, it's either um, um, blacks will say whites are biased and evil, and whites will say blacks are lazy. Yeah. So, um, and that is generating an enormous amount of resentment. And it's... It's like a general smashing this radio during a war or a battle. You don't, if you won't listen to the information coming in, you're going to end up in a lot of trouble. Um, there is, um, I, I'll, I'll do a tiny rant here. I know you're a tiny rant here, if you'll, if you'll indulge me. Uh, number one is, is the degree to which the really smart blacks get swept up in the problems of affirmative action. Uh, because, of course, in the past, before affirmative action, then any black who graduated with a degree was considered the equivalent, and rightly so, of anybody else who graduated with a degree. But what's happened now, and you can actually trace this historically and statistically, is that a few smarter blacks are opting to go to college because when they graduate, the employers don't know whether they were there from natural ability or from affirmative action. So it's actually made the value of a black degree go down through affirmative action, thus resulting in lower opportunities for, you know, the, the legions and many hundreds of thousands of very intelligent blacks out there in society, which is a real tragedy. And number two, I mean, I know I'm stepping way over the bounds of, of genetics here, which we can talk about in a few minutes, but, oh man, it's so frustrating because there are some actions that can be taken which seem to have a positive impact on IQ. You know, early childhood, uh, best diet possible, you know, that's going to help a little bit. Uh, from some of the experts I have had on, if you negotiate with your children rather than applying massive amounts of corporal punishment, there seem to be some positive effects on IQ. Um, if you follow 18 months to 24 months of worth of breastfeeding, that's going to have some positive effects on IQ. And these are things which Everybody can do if they're told about it often enough and reminded about it often enough. So just by blaming, uh, you know, slavery and Jim Crow and racism and, and all of this sort of stuff, we're actually not only not diagnosing the problem correctly, but we're completely bypassing a variety of solutions that could genuinely help the black community. And that's what I think is so viciously destructive about this whole avoidance. Well, those are, um, before getting onto that, I just want to go back to the college example, 
because of affirmative action in selection, say on the basis of SATs, in some schools like University of California, Berkeley, as, as Herrnstein and, and Murray showed, there's virtually no overlap in the abilities of the two populations. They, they are just set up to be unable to compete, um, which I think is cruel. And it sets up the university um, for endless problems. But to go back to things that could be done, right? The things that you mention might help in childhood. But those sorts of things, unless a child is at the extremes, I mean, real extremes of deprivation, they don't last. Mm. What we find, and, and no one in the field expected this, okay, no one. We all thought, as most people do, you know, as the slings and arrows of outrageous misfortune accumulate, the environment has more and more effect on you. Turns out, and I'll link this in a minute to freedom of the market, that heritability of intelligence is that we can measure it in infancy and toddlerhood is low, maybe 20%. Uh, later, in elementary school, it's about 40%. You get to high school, it's like 60 or 70. And by uh, adulthood, middle adulthood, it's 80%. That means that your phenotype, that is your observed intelligence, is correlated 0.9 with your genotype. Now that's in Western countries. So what is it that causes the environment to, the shared environment to wash away? Here's that's one of the shocking things to all of us in the field, although I don't claim to be a geneticist, is that the, the shared effects of environment, of a family that hit brothers and sisters, two sisters equally, or more or less equally, they, they rival heritability in elementary school, but they go essentially to zero by adulthood. And what does matter is, which is a small part of the environmental effect, is what's called non-shared. It's what hits one child separately from another child in the same family. Maybe it's illness, maybe, maybe they pursued a different course in life. So we still don't know why the heritability goes up, but it goes up for educational attainment too is that people, what I think of as their, their genetic compass, their inner compass, it leads them to pursue different things. Some will pursue reading, some will pursue sports or art, um, and develop those uh, abilities. But we line up with our genes pretty much in intelligence by adulthood. And you can see, when I teach, intelligence in everyday life to college freshmen. I give them some compelling facts. Now they don't prove what I'm trying to, the, the large body of evidence I'm trying to get across, but they are very impressive. For example, if you have adopted children, I mean children who are adopted into a family, their IQs will, by high school, correlate more with their biological mothers and won't correlate at all with their adoptive mothers. And that fits with their intelligence becoming more heritable. Or, I ask my students, who are still naive, what happens if you have, and it helps if they're freshmen, you get older students in there, they already have their notions fixed, I think, but what if you had identical twins and you separated them and put them in different families? They didn't know that they were even a twin, right? Well, a um, colleague of mine, I honor myself by saying his colleague, uh, Thomas Bouchard, uh, started collecting, so to speak, these people, oh, decades ago. 
and he tested them on myriad things, including intelligence. And it turns out they're just about as like as identical twins reared together. And they're a lot more alike than fraternal twins. I mean, fraternal, I mean, regular brothers and sisters married together. It's like they're taking the same, same person, taking the test twice. So how do you explain that with, um, and they correlate about 0.8, okay? So these are, these are just a few of the compelling facts that by themselves don't prove anything, but they really make you stop and, and question the, the zeitgeist that environment uh, explains all. You can take kids starving, right? Starving kids in Indonesia, so they're East Asian, have them adopted into uh, Scandinavian families. It's been done. And lo and behold, their IQs are higher than the, their sibs in the same family that were by, born to, to the, the mothers, the natural mothers. Um, so these, these are some ticklers, okay? That, how are you going to explain them? It's, and, you know, it's, it's tough. No, no, go ahead, finish your thought. I'll, I'll hold mine. Go ahead. Just, just so I won't forget it, okay? Um, but it, it follows up a point of yours about freedom. And if you, the more, it, the ideal seems to be if everybody had exactly the same advantages, right? They would be alike in intelligence or more alike anyway. Um, it turns out and the more freedom you give them to be who they are. Well, what's been found is that if you equalize opportunities or resources in school, or as Britain did, equalize access to health care in the 50s, what happens is that everybody may benefit, but who benefits more? The brighter people. So. Class differences increase in, in the, what they are called disparities now. The disparities in health increase. The disparities in educational achievement increase. Um, one colleague has called it the Matthew effect. He's written about it. So it's, it's like backfires in some sense. And um, if you're going to raise the mean, you're going to expand the variance and variant, variation among people. And variation, uh, a synonym of it in sociology and politics is inequality. <laughs> right. Right? Yeah. So, uh, it's, and the more inheritabilities go up when people are free. If you don't allow people to be who they are, um, you know, you don't allow them to follow their inner compass. Uh, or develop who they are, heritabilities will fall. But that's not what we're hoping for. <laughs> no, I mean, if, if you ban singing, then great singers don't make a lot of money. I mean, I think that you, the freedom and all that. And I, I tell you, I mean, Linda, it's, it's, it's I, I have this emotional resistance to, to the genetics. And, and I'm, I'm sure I'm speaking for a lot, you know, like, because I, I feel it's like... It's, you, let me it, give you something that will help. But go okay. ahead, go ahead. <laughs> well, it's sort of, I feel like a stick insect trying to climb a waterfall. You know, I'm sure I can do it, but then this data just keeps coming down and knocking me away and putting me back down in the pool. Because we all like to think that it's a solvable problem. And the degree to which... Me, the problem these, in what? The, the, the disparate intelligences, be, uh, okay. in average intelligences between uh, ethnicities. Okay. Because we've got this multicultural society. And if we yes. have, in general, a... Again, we're speaking statistically overall. I have to put right, these right. caveats into every show. You know, yeah, this is yeah. all big picture stuff. You know, 15 Lots to 20 percent of, of blacks are smart, smarter than the average whites. And, you know, I've been heavily influenced by some very heavy hitting black intellectuals, Tom Sowell and, and Shelby Steele and Walter Williams and so yes. on. So this is all big picture stuff. But if overall there's kind of a doomed underclass or two and a bunch of overlords, so to speak, in, in a free society, 
that, so I feel this this resistance to it, but as the evidence, and I've you know I've had Dr. Flynn on and, and other um, Dr. Turkheimer on and so on, other people who are more environmentarians or whatever you'd want to call them, and I just feel that the evidence can't be resisted. And again, until we have incontrovertible genome disparities and it becomes you know at some point if it's valid that it's genetics, it's going to be irresistible. But when I hear things like, you know, uh, blacks uh, adopted into white families end up with the same intelligence range as those who weren't. And people say, oh, well, it's expectations. Everyone expects the blacks aren't going to do as well. And then you find out that there are black kids who were so pale that everyone thought they were white, even though they're largely black yes. genetically. And they still end up with the same uh, end, uh, IQ. And when you find out that blacks from the highest 20% of socioeconomic status still underperform whites from the bottom 20% of socioeconomic status. And when you find out that genetic proximity and intelligence is dose dependent, that your siblings are more like you and then your cousins a little bit less and it fades away to the 17 point IQ difference with strangers, although you've got 12 between siblings, yeah. Yeah. it seems like it's one of these just straw that breaks the camel's back because all, none of these things are final but together they accumulate, to me at least, to portray a worldview that is emotionally difficult, which, you know, is just something to admit. It's not obviously something you can guide your, your conclusions by. But I really am having a tough time getting up that waterfall of, of, of the environmental side. And it's tricky because, of course, environmental, it's sort of like the difference between boys and girls' heights. Boys and girls start out about the same. You know, my daughter is, is seven years old, and when I see her playing with other boys, you know, there's tall boys and short boys and tall girls. And uh, but then, of course, by the time everyone's 20, uh, you've got a disparity. And, and it's really confusing to people because it starts out more malleable, right? You, as you pointed out, the Head Start program, which I think over $100 billion was poured into the sinkhole of trying to alter or close ethnic differences in IQ and achievement. And there were some changes and everybody was cheering and saying, aha, vindicated. And then it's like you throw a ball in the air and it just falls back down towards the genetics yeah. over time. Yeah. And it's so, because it's so tricky and the fact that it's not stable throughout early childhood, the fact that environment is so much more stable and the fact that people love testing everyone when they're 12 and saying, aha, look, it's malleable and it's closing. And then they avoid everyone who's 30 because that is where the genetics tend to play out a lot more. Um, it is such a manipulable field for people who want either conclusion that, at least for me, as a decently well-versed layman, it's like stepping into a kaleidoscope or Timothy Leary's brain on an acid trip because it feels like people can find what they want. And that's part of the frustration. You know, like when I was talking to um, James Flynn, and I know you've got something to say about this, uh, there was a study, of course, in post-war Germany where the kids of um, uh, black servicemen and uh, white German women ended up basically a hair's breadth away from the average IQ uh, of, um, uh, of the whites in Germany. And of course, it's called, not like there's no racism in Germany. So this was an example, and Tom Sowell and other people have pointed to that to say, ah, you see, well, it's toxic black culture and it's got nothing to do with genetics. And yet, um, and I'll let you do the rebuttal on that one because this is put forward continually by the people who are more into the environment, but I think that there are good responses around it uh, genetically. Yes, it's one of a handful of studies that have been put forward to ostensibly disprove the possibility or probability that there are genetic differences accounting for the average phenotypic differences between blacks and whites. And people haven't obviously haven't read it very carefully. Um, the they compared the children of, of unions with German women for white servicemen and black servicemen. Now, there is the assumption being made that both the German women and the two sets of servicemen are representative of their populations. Uh, none of the three probably is. We know that the black servicemen are definitely not representative of the black population because um, many were screened out. But really the kicker for me is that people don't mate randomly. If there's one, now these are just liaisons presumably, but um, the the assertive mating uh, among people, men and women, their intelligence correlates about 0.4 among spouses. Now, I'm not saying that these are 
representative spouses, but we don't know who those Superman women were. We don't who were having sex with the the um, different servicemen, which servicemen? Okay, so we don't know the, the mother's IQ, and you have to know the mother's IQ. You have to know the father's IQ. So it tells us absolutely nothing. Just like you were saying, the adoption, the black children adopted into white families, they don't tell us anything either when their outcomes are lower IQ because it could have been for many reasons. But then when you get Asians in the mix, that really throws a monkey wrench into the environmental explanation. So Scandinavians must have been really favoring the, the, the starving adoptees over their own children. But, um, but that, that doesn't happen. So I lost my, my train of thought here. Oh, you, asked, you just asked me about the Eifert study. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, so, yeah, I mean, if you're a black serviceman in Germany in the post-war period oh, okay. and you end up having a girlfriend who's white, we would assume that they would have things in common to chat about. And it's hard to have long conversations or even medium-length conversations when there's wide disparities in intelligence. So you have a selected group of, of blacks who are obviously half the population of blacks in the United States is cut off from the armed forces because of the 85 cutoff. And they're deciding to stay. And, and still, yeah. I'm sorry? It, half were not cut off then. Oh, okay, more recently. But, but yeah, you have a higher IQ population who are interacting with a higher IQ population. So the fact that they would have higher IQ kids does not seem to me to be the final case closed as far as environmentalism goes. It's absolutely ambiguous if it's the best thing you can say about it. Right. Um, so... Now, another uh, question that I have is, as far as the physical structure of the brain goes, um, IQ is um, obviously has these correlations to outcomes in life as a whole, but I think as you've pointed out, it also seems to have significant correlations to very specific parts of the brain, uh, the, the efficiency of the brain, the speed of the brain, the speed of reflexes, uh, glucose levels and transmission levels between neurons and so on, that it seems like, and this has been I think really over the last 10 or 20 years, that with the increased capacity to peer into the brain and see it working, that we can start to see a correlation between um, the IQ and the physical structure uh, of the brain, which of course wasn't around, you know, in the 90s and so on nearly as much. I wonder if you can talk a little bit to people don't feel like you're, we're measuring magic ghosts in the brain or something, but that it's actually mm -hmm. a map of the topography and speed of the brain as well, and size to some degree. Well, it's, uh, let me back up. If you, if intelligence or G is so fundamental and it is fundamental in this, the personal sphere, in affecting performance, and in the social sphere. And, but I should point out, it doesn't have an equal influence because just as important as your level of G is the complexity of the tasks you're facing. Uh, and if there's hope, this is where the, where the hope would lie, that if you're performing, like on an IQ test, if you're performing the simple items and you correlate um, your scores on that um, with some outcome, it's, it's going to be low because those items weren't very complex. Or um, if you're predicting the easy items, let's say, on the functional literacy test. Well, everybody pretty much has the ability to do those, so you're not going to find a correlation. But once you get, let's say, above, well, you're, you're going into higher grade levels, the material is more difficult, then you start seeing um, higher correlations uh, between um, intelligence differences and, and performance, as long as you have the same group of kids there, okay? Once you get to high school, you're losing lots of them, and so it's a much more select group. Uh, different kinds of jobs. This was very important for me early on because I was trying to figure out does it really matter? I, st I didn't start out as a G believer, okay? I started out as a multiple intelligence person basically before it was even became a term. 
And I was interested in what particular abilities, verbal, spatial, whatever, were important in different jobs. And uh, I discovered, that's when I discovered the literature that showed that G basically predicted performance in all jobs. But why would it, but if it were actually intelligence or G, you would not expect it to correlate equally well in all jobs because some jobs are more complex, much more complex. And so I looked at whether the correlations, and, and this is what a good theory should do, give you predictions, you don't know the answer to, you can go out and find the answers, found that Indeed, the correlation between G or any kind of intelligence test and job performance, especially objectively measured, went up with the difficulty of, of the job. Right? So the more complex the task, the bigger the difference any IQ gap will make. Okay? Very important. So you give people a more intellectually tasking uh, um, thing to do, more mental manipulation, you're going to be spreading the people out in terms of performance. Right? And that's exactly what you find. And if you have, say, in employment, to go back to employment or education, if you know the complexity of the material that people have to, the, the job, or the subject in school, and you know the differences, in average differences in IQ in a population, you can predict, like clockwork, what the differences in performance will be. Because G is such a core, such a powerful, and among abilities, it, it it overshadows them all. It's, it carries the freight of prediction, as people say. And this so, we saw, I think, relatively recently when Google released its uh, diversity numbers. And if I remember, this is off the top of my head, but it was something like 30 or 40 percent of the engineers were Asians and 2 percent of them were blacks. And of course, most people jump to the conclusion, well, everyone's the same, and therefore the disparity can only be because of racism. Right, right, right. But the reality is, if you're looking for people with, um, say, visual spatial um, uh, uh, abilities uh, above 120, then yeah, you're going to get 30 to 40 percent of Asians and about 2 percent of blacks. And so it's not actually, uh, it, it's, it's an objective measurement of a difference in a population. Yeah, you could even see it. Well, it certainly accords with, with the difference. Um, oh, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, maybe, I, I calculated what percent of blacks and whites would be, as I put it, eligible for different jobs because they have different IQ ranges associated with them. Okay. Uh, you're not going to be able to get in them and do them unless, basically, unless you're above a certain minimum threshold. And those thresholds march upward, as been known for since the middle of the last century. And what I found was that um, blacks would be overrepresented at, at the bottom end, as they are in special education by about three to one. But at the top end, uh, where you're dealing with executives and and, um, you know, engineers, per capita, it would be one black for 20 whites, per capita, mm. okay? Now, so you, and, but the numbers aren't actually that disparate. So other things clearly, clearly are uh, mattering. And at that time, I don't, um, affirmative action wasn't as strong. So other things do matter. I mean, you can be bright and feckless. Um, there's, as I tell my students, there's, you know, you're, you're all bright, but there's many ways that you can fail. And you can lie in bed and, and imagine how smart you are, but it's not going to get you anywhere. Okay? So, many ways to fail. And in fact, um, I characterize people in the top 5% as the yours to lose people in terms of intelligence. Uh, and many people do screw up. 
Well, and as far as I understand it, IQ is not related to one of the primary drivers of success, which is conscientiousness. Uh, as I'm continually telling my daughter, the secret to success is to learn to do boring things. Because a lot of, you know, a lot of the stuff that, that people do is, is even very smart people who are uh, operating at the highest levels of intellectual achievement. Well, you still got to do your taxes. You still got to buy your groceries. There's a lot of dull stuff even in every field that you have to do, a lot of number crunching yeah, and stuff like that. You're absolutely right. They're... Yeah. People argued for, for a long time that, well, you could select on personality, right? And that would substitute for differences in ability. Nothing substitutes for differences in ability. I mean, nothing can substitute for the ability to learn and reason. Being an extrovert doesn't substitute. Well, it may help you in sales, okay? But the one thing that helps in all jobs, and even like intelligence probably had thousands of studies, and personality hundreds, but is conscientiousness. Um, you, you just got to show up and you got to do it. As, as uh, personal psychologists say, there is the can-do traits in being able to perform a job, abilities, and then there's the will-do <laughs> and conscientiousness and not stealing and, and so on. Well, right. and of course, the, the studies that have shown I'll follow these group. I think they're called the termites for reasons I'm not exactly sure why. Termin, but, because the head of the the um, the man who started the study was Lewis Termin. Oh, sorry, I completely misread it. Yeah. But, but they it's followed these termite. very high IQ people, and they found that at the end of their life, a significant, or close to the end of their life, I think the last study was when they were around 80, that they looked back and they said, ah, I really failed to achieve my full potential. Even Leonardo da Vinci, perhaps arguably the most accomplished human being in history, looked back at the end of his life and he said, oh, I regret only that I made such little <laughs> use of the gifts that God gave me. And it's always, man, if you can't be satisfied, what chance do the rest of us have? And so if you have high ability, of course, that leaves you more prone to worry, uh, perhaps more neuroses. But if you have high ability, then your capacity for regretting underachievement goes up considerably. And that, of course, is the double-edged sword. Everyone thinks, oh, smartness is just, oh, it's wonderful. Who wouldn't want it? Well, you know, a bit of a double-edged sword at times. I don't know, because if a colleague of mine who studies extremely gifted children, they score as well as high school as incoming college students on the SAT at age 12 and 13, okay? And he studied them up to like one in 10,000 of the population, they are so mm. smart. They turn out to be healthier psychologically and physically than other people. So it's not the case that the smart people are, you know, weak. Mm. Um, now, a lot of people are neurotic, Okay, <laughs> we, people differ, but I, I don't think that bright people are more neurotic. Although one thing that should be kept in mind that you brought up earlier is if you're really bright, and it's certainly found among kids, is that you feel like a freak because you are so different from everybody. Think of, think of a child at 140. That's comparable on the other end to an IQ of 60. Mm. And clearly, or kids that he studies are, my friend, uh, IQ around 160. That's like an IQ of 40 on the other end. And those people, people at the other end, they're not even educable, mentally retarded. So they're very different. People at both ends of the spectrum feel out of it socially. So it can be very hard. And, and bright kids, it's like... Their eyes grow wide. You put them in a special class for, for gifted, um, these programs that are created, especially for these high scores. It's like, they feel normal finally. So there could be some of that. Yeah, I mean, when I was younger, I was an assistant teacher at a program for gifted kids. And it was just a whirlwind of possibility with what these people were able to do. And uh, it was Yes. Humbling, of course, as it, as it usually is. And the other thing, too, you could argue is since there has been such a focus over the past decade and a half or so on trying to drag up the low achievers, a proportional amount of less attention has been given to the potential high achievers. And I think that the, the, the high IQ children have been left even more high and dry than they used to be under, at least in American educational systems. Oh, yes. The, the funding is, is paltry for gifted children, and there is a great antipathy in the American school system to having classes for the gifted, mm. to the extent that the schools have them now, and I haven't 
uh, studied this the last couple of years, but I did intensely earlier, is that the, the programs for the gifted, um, the criteria started to shift. Um, it was broader, no tests maybe, and, and for some of the programs, either your parents could nominate you or you could nominate yourself. Okay, so, and, and they focus less on academic things, more on citizenship, helping the community. Now, those are all worthy things, but they're not intellectual giftedness. They're so, not reloaded activities, right? No, no. And there is, the, the notion is that, well, they can take care of themselves, or they can take care of their compatriots in school through peer tutoring which I think is a form of exploitation. Um, but they could go so much further. And the way gifted children are, are handled now, I think, for the most part, is letting them go to college, take college courses during high school, um, summer programs, um, essentially escaping from high school, at least for part of the day, to, to do things that, that are more challenging because that's also easier for schools. They don't have to set up gifted programs and explain why they have gifted programs uh, and then face disparate impact and selection into them. Um, yeah, that certainly happened in my school. Um, I was uh, in grade eight uh, and was put into a grade 13 uh, English class just because they just jumped me up rather than that. Sure. And sorry, to correct, it was not a teacher's, it was more of a teacher's aide or whatever than a uh, now, let's, there's two, two other doctors I'd like to touch on, and um, I'll let you choose which order we go in. Uh, Dr. Flynn, of course, who's been on the show, and Dr. Rushton, unfortunately, who can't be on the show because he passed away a few years ago. Um, I'll, I'll let you choose which, which note you want to end on, um, because they're both, of course, fascinating people to talk about, and we've talked about the Flynn effect quite a bit, and I've mentioned Rushton uh, here and there, but uh, oh. I think a further explication of his theories uh, is, is definitely in order. I will begin with James Flynn because I only want to say a little bit. Uh, Phil Rushton was an excellent researcher and I think, and I want to point to some of the things that he has done that are really a model for, for other researchers, uh, regardless of whether they're dealing with race or not, which many won't. <laughs> but uh, James Flynn, um, is, um, I guess he's a philosopher who originally worked in the South here. He's very interested in the civil rights, moved to New Zealand. Um, some decades ago, he discovered, all the others had discovered it beforehand, but he made a lot more of it, more detailed information, that successive IQ tests um, well, let me back up. IQ tests have to be uh, renormed uh, when their new versions are put out. They have to be updated and modernized. Okay. And uh, I, can I back up just for a minute? Totally. Uh, on the IQ, uh, IQ tests, people have this notion that their paper and pencil, I said before, that the best ones are. Um, one-on-one -on -one. will take maybe an hour, hour and a half. I used to let my students play with them, so to speak. I didn't give them to them, okay? But they could see what they were, and they just had a great time, okay? There's blocks that you're supposed to copy a, a template. There's like a... a five picture completion. I don't know if they're still on the, the more recent versions. Where it's like a cartoon where you have five panels and you put them in order to create a story. Um, you have number series like two, four, six, what's the next one? And they get really complicated. And they just had a wonderful time. And most people enjoy taking them. Okay, so it's nothing like the stereotype that, that people have of intelligence tests. Anyway, an important thing about these tests, though, is that they have different subtests. Because they're supposed to get at different aspects of cognition, because you want to sample widely in order to 
get a good, well, we would say now, to get a good sampling of G in different formats, numbers, letters, pictures, doesn't matter. And, um, but to get the IQ score, you add them up, you know, 10 from this, 15 from that, and then you get an IQ score. Well, he discovered, uh, James Flynn, that when you renorm the tests, like if you, you give the new test to people, a set of people who also take the old test, right? And if you find that they score better on one test than the other, well, if they score worse on the new test, which they usually do, then um, is it worse than, than the old one, then um, you have to reassign where the 100 goes, okay? So what you find is the 100 creeps up. But how do you know that it's the G that's gone up when the IQ scores have gone up? Because G is within all of those subtests. Some of them, a great variety of excellent measures of G, from block design to verbal reasoning. And they're very different. One's verbal, one's not. Um, and what he found was that only some of this, and other people too, have found that only some of the subtest scores went up. So how can that be if G, in, you know, permeates all of them? Why don't all of them go up? Okay. Now this is a very big mystery. Um, at first, I would have argued that is merely. Uh, something to do with the test or the construction of the test um, that's not related to G. But height has gone up as well. And it's gone up about the same amount in Western countries. So there's something biological going on. Well, and as you've pointed out as well, um, when height goes up in the bell curve, the, um, uh, the distribution doesn't change. Right, so everybody marches up. It's not like it everybody compresses, marches. right? Everybody marches up. So the height has gone up, but the distribution in the bell curve of height from very short to very tall that, remains about the same. That's hard, hard to tell for various reasons. But, but I should also point out, and Flynn would too, that this secular increase is stopping. You know, it seems to start and then it levels off and then there's some regression. I mean, it goes down again. So we don't know what it is. To uh, a lot of people have been studying it. And some of it is artifactual, as we say, it has to maybe to do with guessing, parameters, you know, and so on. But if there's a biological explanation, I have two theories, but um, that could be tested. One is that with lower um, race, less infectious disease, our bodies are freed up mm. to invest more in the, in the brain, uh, but not necessarily all parts of it. Um, some of those subtests are going up, and you asked before about parts of the brain. G seems to be spread throughout the brain. No matter what you measure, it seems to correlate with G. Th white matter thickness, um, how much gray matter you have, um, many, many other things. It's hard to find anything that isn't correlated with G. But there are parts of the brain that contribute to verbal and to spatial. I mean, there, there are lobes of the brain, uh, Brogman's area, uh, and, and so on. So it could be that some of the particular abilities, this specificity, they call it in the test, is somehow being biologically affected. But it there's a lot of people jumped on the, the idea that IQ scores scores are going up to say, well, then we don't have to pay any attention to all this other genetic stuff. We don't have to pay attention to anything else. It has saved us from this, this huge network of data that links everything from the genes, 